I don't think anybody should do this because I don't know anybody's personal situations, but I think um, it is worth as any business owner, at least understanding the concept and being like Trevor, being super sarcastic, uh, sarcastic. Yeah, he is sarcastic. He is sarcastic. Being super, super skeptical along the way. Today is one of the most exciting days for me because I have never interviewed a celebrity before. And today is the day. Emmy Award winning producer John Briggs. He is a creative content producer with Food Fight Studios. Two Emmy nominations and a winner. And we're going to get that trophy out. Today, we're going to be talking about top small business mistakes. John is an entrepreneur through and through. In reading your LinkedIn profile, I saw that there was all kinds of fun things with sales. And you had mentioned flipping homes. And now you are a creative content producer in an animation studio. John has aligned himself with work with Gary Vaynerchuk, Paul Logan, Seth Godin, and some of the top influencers. When John is not creating and making animation films, he is uh, unabashedly changing diapers for his youngest son. <laughs> so that's really fun. And you have two other sons and you coach them with your little league. Yep. I am so excited. Thank you so much for being here and talking about small business. Yeah, no, I'm super excited to be here. Definitely not a celebrity i am more of a celebrity than paul logan i don't know who that is but uh, oh it was logan paul, <laughs> yes, uh, logan paul. so it's all good but yeah no i'm excited excited to be here and have a good good little chat with you i would love for you to share a bit about how you got into the animation and what led you through your your entrepreneurial path and perhaps you can also share about your experience with web3 and how that has affected your business yeah no it's a it's a lot you know i've always been doing some sort of quote unquote entrepreneur type activities even since i was a kid so when i was in college i uh, i had like a painting franchise uh, college pro painters and that's that's where i learned a lot of the different things and kind of got my feet wet in business but i've done a bunch of different things i think when you're younger and and you're, you're curious, you're always trying to test out the different waters. So let's see here. Yeah, you, said, you mentioned I flipped houses, which was great and fun. I've had a DJ business which is like a, wow. like, right. So oh, yeah. uh, I don't, I've never DJed. I posed on a camera once, but it was just for like a, a an Instagram, but yeah, I had a, a, a little DJ business, which was just simple. I've had a medical device distributorship and that's what led me into the content game is I just did really well with the medical device distributorship, but I hated it and didn't want to do that stuff and kind of wanted to do things on my own terms. And I'm not an animator. I can't draw just like I can't DJ. I just wanted to do stuff that I was happy to wake up in the morning and, and that was crazy creating. And here we are seven years later. Wow. Well, I love in your bio that you sent to me. Thank you very much. And of course, I go off script all the time. It, so, it was um, written by like an AI bot or something. So I didn't write that <laughs> stuff. So this is using good. AI, using technology. That's awesome. That's why and you think I'm a celebrity, but I'll, I'll, I'll thank Jasper. I've never won an Emmy. Has anyone out there won an Emmy that is listening to this right now? Perhaps Maybe. not. Maybe, Maybe. Paul Logan. <laughs> I was working for it's a W2 company before I jumped in to open up my own medical device distributorship. And the reason I did do that was the company I was working for, they mandated that you had to sell a certain product because that's where their R&D went into. But for me, um, I just didn't feel comfortable that the, it was ready at that point. I kind of voiced it. Um, I was called out at a meeting and said, hey, you're doing well with this. Just tell us your secrets here. And I gave the honest feedback and just said, you know, it's, this is awesome. This is going to be amazing. It's going to help a lot of people, but it's not ready yet. And I'm excited for it. But the company kind of came around and started like writing me up for like wrinkled clothes. And oh. you could just start to see that they wanted you out. And the reality was any of that stuff was taken out of my hands. And and for me, at the end of the day, I want to be able to sleep at night. So I wanted to, to I, I naively said, you know what, I'm going to open up my own medical device distributorship because then I can pick the products. And that was great. I actually picked up one of the products that was a competitor of that company and like blew them out of the water a, a little bit. But still, there was a lot of money to be had. And where that happens comes a lot of bad actors and a lot of people. And it's funny that people call the NFT the, the Wow Wow West. Like it's not the first time I heard that because the stuff that I was doing in our medical device distributorship in the early days, people referred to it as the Wild Wild West. And the joke that I still say now is, is when people call those industries that, then, you know, Wyatt Earp is not too far off, right? I bounced out of that because at the end of the day, I, I wanted to, again, still be doing things that I love with people that I like doing it and not have to compete with people that are not in the ethical realm that I want to be in. So I was out of medical for good and started the e-commerce stuff, the t-shirt stuff to just to 
not to sell t-shirts, but just to learn e-commerce, yeah. which became, how do you market it? You market it with content marketing. Okay. And the question you had earlier was, do I work with those people? One of the cool things was being in that book by Mark Schaefer, which was awesome on one chapter was Vaynerchuk and on a subsequent chapter was, was James Altucher. And it kind of gave me a seat at the table where I can at least say, Hey, we're in the same book. And I saw an animator that had animated a ask Gary V question. Mm-hmm. And as I was starting animation, uh, having a difficult time with the animator that I hired at first. I reached out to that dude. He was a waiter in England and just wanted to be a digital marketer or be in the content game, but didn't know how to do it. So like a lot of people were using Gary Vee as their, their person that they were following. And when I saw that, I reached out, hired him, and he went out and with his contacts and said, hey, can we do another animation? We did two animations for Vaynerchuk back then. They blew up. Uh, it was animating a podcast. It shows you how much I know a business because I was like, why the hell would anybody want to animate a podcast? But it was great content got millions of views. The guest was James Altucher, who just happened to be in that book. James reached out. We uh, connected. I've done a shit ton of stuff with James, including a documentary or a docuseries that's on Amazon Prime called Choose Yourself. And that's kind of how it got started. But James asked us, hey, can you do 10 of my podcast episodes? And it was Sarah Blakely and Tony Robbins and um, and, and Wycliffe Jean and all these different things. So five out of 10 of those hit us up and said, hey, can you create for us? And then and we started doing that. And then you know, before you know it, it's like, hey, I got a book coming out. Do you have uh, any suggestions? And it's like, well, why don't we make an animated miniseries to help put your book out there? Or, hey, I got a concert or I have a music video and can you do that? And then that's what ended up being nominated for the Emmy Lost This One for a concert. And we had never done that stuff, but we did the, all the visuals for a Wycliffe Jean concert at the Apollo Theater. And I shit you not, I didn't know it was going to work until sound check because I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know, like, is the format correct? He just asked me to do some stuff. I said, yeah, (laughs) who's doing the rest? And he said, eh, it's just going to be a a boring little, he didn't say this, but my thought is it's just going to be a boring little logo that was going to be on the back of the screen while he was singing. And I was like, let me do it. And um, within five or six days, we put together the rest of the visuals for that thing, which got nominated for an Emmy and was one of the coolest, coolest things I did, which was fun. Well, where's the Emmy? I have one. And you only reason it's here is because you asked me to knock the dust off it. It's gonna get oh tangled my up God, look at it. <gasps> so it t- I've, never long seen, enough. I've never seen one up close like this, this close, even though we're yeah. on camera. Let me see. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah, bring it over. Yeah. Oh, the, the coolest thing about this one mm-hmm. is it's got a screw loose. So when like, so I was like, they, they were like, oh, send it back. Well, I was like, no way. This one is meant for me. <laughs> this one is meant for me. So I got the, I got this thing. So Susan Lucci, eat your heart out. I got my, my <laughs> screw loose Emmy, but it's the real deal, man. It's cool. It says on the bottom, if you die, your family can't throw it away. You either need to keep it or return it back to the Academy, whatever the hell that is. So no way. And it's, uh, it's been pretty fun. That is so exciting. Thank you for dusting off the dust on your Emmy. Tell me a little bit about this with the specializing of storytelling and brand building, because that's you're talking my language when it comes to how business owners can be better at bragging about themselves a little bit more. And part of the storytelling is essential because otherwise it's just like, you know, I'm a CEO or I'm a president of that's a big deal for you being able to help clients, right? Yeah, no, I mean, look, I think the the storytelling is just something that's I've always had since I was a kid and storytelling has kind of become a, a buzzword a little bit. But the reality is it's just, I like making shit up. I like creating and I also love business. So when you can intersect those two worlds and kind of tell a story that's captivating and engaging and and has a point to it, I think that is where this is where those two intersect. It's what I love to do. You picked the right person because I got a lot of uh, mistakes that I can uh, I can definitely spew off. If we have like a lightning round, I'll just go and go and go. And sp- it's going to happen All after right. you tell me what the L means in your name, which let me re- let me take off the banner so we yeah. can yeah, no, people so will be like JL. Yeah. So my name is John, but uh, how that kind of happened is that my, my email was, was JLB and uh, the people that were interacting with, they're busy people and they don't really remember stuff, but it was something that kind of stuck. And I just kind of ran with it because some would call me JL. I remember asking one of the, the people that, uh, you know, famous dude. And I was like, John or JL, I was like, whatever, whatever you can remember. And he was like, I'll call you JL. So it kind of stuck in that little circle, but most people know me by John, whatever you can remember, <laughs> I'll, I'm here and I'll, I'll change it here too, if you want. 
want. Whatever you want to uh, do. Okay. It is your brand, baby. You could call me whatever whatever you want, um, for sure. Just not a celebrity or Paul Logan. That's <laughs> the, don't don't call me those two. I love it. I'll get let you get that set up. But while you're doing that, can you share a little bit about what was it like to work with these cats and how that come about? Yeah, so it's a book called Known um, by ah. by Mark Schaefer, which is a great great author, a great marketer. Definitely it seems like you know him. Yes, mm-hmm. I have that book. Oh, cool. What 56, chapter are you on? Page 56, yeah. Not that I remember it uh, that all oh, that well. 56 was my pager code. That's why I remember it back in the day, like when oh, you go page so... people. But I have to a... tell you, I would have thought you were younger. Yep, yeah, post pagers. But uh, maybe I'm just a, a, a late adapter to technology either way. But I guess backing up, I said before, I hated medical device business and, and did really well with it. But it's not something I wanted to do. So and I was trying to understand, like, what is the future here? And at that point, it was e-commerce, right? So you started to see some of these things pop up. And I started like a Shopify store just to learn e-commerce, not to sell t-shirts, but just to learn mm-hmm. e-commerce. And I'm originally from the New England area, huge sports fan. When I moved to Miami, I would go to all the games and they play every year down here with these annoying dolphin fans. So I came across a t-shirt that uh, I had to have, and it was a dolphin logo, but it was cut up in sushi. And I went uh, on the site the site was like slow. You couldn't contact it. Clearly they were out of business, but I did what you did to my LinkedIn profile and I stalked and stalked and stalked and ended up finding the artist and bought a couple of the logos off of them. I think four or five logos we bought. And then I had him create a few more. And then I met somebody on 99 Designs and created 40 something more logos. And it was called Parody Tees at the, at the time. And, and again, it was to learn e-commerce and did it with my partner, Mike Neubauer. And he popped in, big sports fan as well, and, and said, I like what you're doing here with these logos. Let's figure this out. So we started that. And the next step was content, content marketing. And that's kind of how Schaefer came into the, the picture because I was trying to learn that. And we had done everything we can with the logos. People were stealing them, selling them on Amazon. The Dallas Morning News, I remember one time for for their editorial use, stole the the Patriots logo when the Dallas Cowboys played. So we knew we had something. And it's like, how do we keep this party going? What's the next thing? And I woke up and said, let's make a cartoon. And that's literally how we started creating in the content game is we created these little goofy parody tees cartoons, which was just good, clean, fun, talking shit about sports and sports teams. We interviewed Mike a couple weeks ago, and we talked extensively about the unfan.xyz project. I don't think I've ever had as much fun watching football than with this project with you guys. And it's been absolutely brilliant. It's a brilliant concept. The parody is just fun. Everything is just upside down with the concept. What, you know, the logos, you know, the winner's bracket instead of the winner's bracket. And everything is opposite. So if you're losing, you're really winning because the teams are losing, but you get more points when they lose. It's been a lot of fun. So was that the first time you uh, worked with Mike? Is that the first project? I don't know. I've known Mike for like 18 years or something along those lines. A buddy that I went to high school with went to college college with him and they went to college in Montreal where you could the drinking age was under 21 so you could just uh, I lived in New Hampshire we'd just drive up there from my college and, and that's where I met Mike uh, from there and it just so happened when I moved to Miami 13 or 14 years ago whenever the heck it was like a few months later he moved to Fort Lauderdale we linked back up at that point and uh, became friends but he's a good cat and I think that's one of the best things I've ever done in business is just making sure that you like the people that like the work you're doing but like the people you're doing it with and yeah. that you know like and trust and And we started that parody tease back in the day. We started that and it was nice to come kind of full circle and kind of take this back up where we left off because I think some of the new technologies allowed us to do something we've always wanted to do, which was kind of create a game out of these, you know, goofy little parody logos that we were doing all along that became unfantasy sports. And that's what what you've been rocking at in in this league. Now, parody tease, though, that's the... Umbrella Corporation is that the LLC or yeah? So par- I mean, Parity Tees is a tea shop and merch site that still left up there just because it's it's it was our baby that we were going to come back to. But unfan to see sports and unfan it can be confusing to start out of the gate. So instead of calling it Parity Tees, unfancy football by Parity Tees and all this stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, it just yeah, yeah. Unfan. And Got it. we'll start to build the brand around unfantasy sports, not Parity Tees. It'll be on yeah. fantasy sports. This is our unfan football league, and we'll we'll go from there. 
Well, the mechanics are brilliant. I mean, you guys have really covered your basis. One thing that I loved about this was that you don't have to track every player. That was too overwhelming for me. So I loved how you guys you guys kept it to just the teams and the scoring categories. So that was really cool. Yeah, there's all reasons for all of those different types of things. One is parody content, right? So the logos are protected under by doing a parody with fair use, right? So it doesn't make sense if you're going to be consistent with your brand to have a fantasy football league. The logo you get is making fun of the Broncos, but you want the Broncos to win. So we just kind of flipped it on reverse, yeah. which is kind of like a mind you know what for people at first. But as we've gone through this inaugural pilot season and tested a lot of these concepts out, it's been cool. And I think that's one of the, the things that we've done really well is instead of figuring this all out and how the messaging should be, we were in waiting till next year. We we're just like, let's just start it up. And mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you have the goal of just making sure you're creating value for people that, uh, that are in the league and give their time and, and their, their money to jump into this thing, then um, and you're, if you're relentlessly focused on value, the rest will figure itself out. And by the end of this thing, everybody will love it. But we didn't have a lot of the stuff that you are commenting on and saying that you like. We didn't have a lot of that stuff figured out as, oh, until really? as, as we go. You just got to start sometimes. Wow. See, now I love what you just said. You just, Sometimes you just have to start. I think a lot of people get hung up in business that it has to be perfect. Otherwise, their credibility could be at risk. And I'm with you on that. Sometimes you do have to just execute so that you can learn from those actions and you know if people are unforgiving then they weren't your fans anyway and they were never going to be clients they were never going to be a part of it they were just you know wanting to bash or all the negative trolling kind of nonsense but i love that you got to just start you know one of the things that grinds my gears a little bit is uh but i think that, and i think it, it's a trap that a lot of good people fall into is when you have when you're in the content creation game you are looking up to people that are doing things a certain way and they may look like they are success. I've worked with a lot of people. I can tell you behind the curtains, they are the Wizard of Oz them themselves, right? But they start to mimic people. So they'll look at Gary Vee and they will, uh, they'll think, well, I got to say it like he does and do all this and stuff. And that just becomes like a copy machine uh, mm. every time somebody, and somebody copies them. And just like a real copy machine, it's not that every time you copy it, it gets watered down and watered down. Before you know it, you have like these, uh, these Insta gurus out there that aren't really valuable or helping people. But I think some people, they feel like they have to be that right out of the gate. They feel like they have to kind of come on camera and say, hey, this is how you change your life in five steps in a Twitter thread, right? And that's not really the case. I think you can just be authentic and uh -huh. uh, and go out there. And, and if you are adding value to people, then people are pretty forgiving and uh, whether they like you or not, because at the end of the day, the, the zero sum game is not such. They are getting value themselves. So I'm a big proponent of having a dose of humility as part of your story, because you didn't have it all figured out. We don't always all the time have it all figured out. And that's one of the things about even this channel that with Simple Sense for Small Business is because we've made mistakes. We've seen mistakes being made. And I do appreciate when someone like you were saying, we didn't have it figured out, but we just started. And then we kind of along the way, we did it. So one question I do have for you is with the NFL team logos and the parody of the logos, was there any conflict with the NFL or was there any copyright stuff happening with, with that? No, we, I mean, it look, it may look like the, just cause the way the, the logos are designed and how we started this thing out, that it was just a bunch of kids in the basement, but I made sure that we, we got our T's crossed and our dots uh, are eyes dotted and <laughs> went to an attorney. And at the time the attorney had represented a plaintiff that was, or a defendant that was going against Katy Perry. I don't know if you remember in the Super Bowl, but there was Katy Perry was performing and there was a, it was called left shark. She had two people, one on her right or two shark costumes, one on her right and one on her left. And the left shark was like clearly going out and didn't remember the dance moves or something. It became a meme of some sort and somebody made and started selling left shark merch and oh. Katy Perry's, I'm sure she didn't do it, but her, her management or something, maybe she did, sued this this kid and they they won. So I had used that same attorney, oh, uh, wow. attorney, that, attorney that worked on, on those cases as a consultant. And uh, I had to write a legal opinion that just basically says, hey, here are some legal opinions. Of course, anything can happen, right? But here's some precedents in the law that protects these logos in the fair use uh, and trademark clause. Oh. So as, as long as you can, sh as long as there's no confusion that like the New England Patriots wouldn't put out a spy gate and a deflate gate logo, which they wouldn't, then then you're good. That's one of the, the ways to fall on. So there was a case where 
the company lost, there was a dog toy company that made Chewy Vuittons and it said like CV instead of LV and LVMH sued them and won because the judge said there could be consumer confusion. And if that's the case, then you're kind of past that gray area of trademark and copyright, which is, let's be honest, it's a gray area no matter what. Mike and I had talked about it back then because that's the first question you got when people saw these things. Let's pick a fight, right? Like it'd be awesome if the NFL sued us like these little guys to right. make these goofy logos. That would be great. Business would business would be booming. So we'd never shied away from, from any of that stuff, but definitely before we got into it, made sure that we were good. That's one thing where you did not risk the, let's just start and see what happens. Those are the kinds of things you kind of mm. have to have some common sense with what are the things to risk and not risk with not knowing enough and certainly knowing the NFL and the, the NFL teams and they've been around for how long you don't want to mess with that so that was really smart and I'm sure though it was kind of annoying because then you got to get lawyers involved and you know that could be expensive yep before you even start anything yep 100% look nobody's anybody can sue anybody so you just got to do your best uh, to protect yourself from there and I've always felt super comfortable as we've gotten going with this stuff just based on that but if disney bought a team they sue everybody so maybe they would sue me from yeah. that but it is what it is <laughs> and when mike and i met in mike's office because that was the first unfantasy group meeting seven years ago when that happened we flew asher who was the, the gentleman that we we're talking about the animator we flew him from england we flew a comedian from vegas and it was just four of us dudes in Mike's office. And when we had a meeting, it was, I don't know how we're going to get there, but eventually we're going to do documentaries. We're going to do some really cool things. We're going to be recreating content for great people. And that was said in that first day, seven years ago or six years ago. And here we are, and we've, we've done that stuff. So I think it's part manifesting and part jumping out there and, and just knowing what you want to do and just going for it. Because even winning an Emmy, there's a path to do that. Now, do they give an Emmy to every person on the team, right? Is that how it works? No. So I was submitted on it as a, as a producer. You guys submit the names for it. So any, look, anything I do is team. And I hate, I freaking hate the fact that this Emmy is my name on it and not, not the team. So okay. it's a sore subject for me personally. But the next one that we got nominated, I was able to get their names on it because you have to pay to get their names on it. And we got nominated. So now they can say they are an Emmy nominated animator or Emmy nominated line producer or whatever the heck they are, which mm -hmm. is awesome. Which really doesn't, what's the difference, right? Emmy nominated, yeah. Emmy winning. It's at the point it says Emmy in it. People look at you differently and randomly why. I don't know, but but that's what they do. You're like over and above humble. I'm kind uh, of a cocky prick too, but yes, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> and the truth comes out well can we talk about the next question i had which was well what about running a business jazzes you the most because as we know some days are better than others no look and i think it's i don't have to look to the future what could go wrong like you're an entrepreneur you have those moments i go through those moments now right so there's mm -hmm. a shit ton of stuff that doesn't go perfectly uh, along the way and it's ebbs and flows what excites me about it the most i think i said for me it's making cool shit with cool people doing cool things but it's also the ability to solve problems and i think that's what i like the most and one of the things that we've done ever since the the vaynerchuk and we're very grateful for it is we've been creating for other people which yeah. ironically enough made it made us so busy that we couldn't come back to the unfantasy sports stuff because we we're so busy creating for other people but what oh. i like the most is sitting down with people that are, you know, influencers or musicians or actors or whatnot, and trying to understand what they're trying to accomplish and then kind of produce content around that. And I think that's where my skill set and strong suit is the strategic side, but also being able to be creative with it as well at the same time. Seven years, like that's a long time to not do something when the idea presented itself and the work you put into it, i.e. the attorney's yeah, like it is what it is. I think it, it it took us on a path that didn't expect at all. But I think that's always been my mentality. Nothing would shock me if you said, "Hey, John, would it shock me if you if I said seven years from now you're going to be doing this?" That w nothing you could say would shock me, because that could I just the things that could happen that let lead up to that. So the saying when people saying like, "If you told me seven years ago I was doing this, I thought I told you you're crazy." I, I've never had that mentality because I have no clue where this stuff is going to go. And what it just led in the path was. It kind of highlighted that we we were great at producing funny content that stood out. And obviously people want content that stands out. And mm -hmm. it brought us into a variety of different things where it's filmmakers that have gaps in footage. And can you help us out? The Emmy that we won, what I'm most proud of that was that 
they had a deadline to get out and it was during COVID. They needed it in a month and they couldn't go shoot more film for it. So basically they oh, they wow. just gave me clips of Dean Kamen, who's the inventor of the Segway, talking about uh, Newton's laws of motion. And I failed physics uh, <laughs> twice. So now here I am as filmmakers trying to tell me, can you go explain Newton's second law of motion using animation? Uh, and we have 30 days to do it. And we did it. And the team pulled it off and we won an Emmy for that, which is, that's what, that's what I'm most proud of. Not necessarily the, the trophy, but the process. Wow. You know, that is so smart though, because it's like bionic B-roll, B-roll on steroids. People need it, right? So if we do more than just animation, we'll do video edits and, and things like that. We've won awards that were won by Disney on stuff that uh, just from stock footage curation and just editing them up and cutting them up in, in the right way. So there's more than just animation, but that's what we got brought out for was because we were good at creating different types of content for people strategically. And that's kind of what we've done. Now we kind of get to come back and do it for ourselves. So we partnered with the Battle Bunnies and, and Frank and Krista are people that I've known for 10 years and we partnered with them and we're also uh, doing the unfantasy stuff, but it's all linked together. It's There's nothing separate about the things that we're doing for the unfantasy because we are into NFTs and, and that scary word into, into Web3, but we are going out there and doing it and testing along the way that has implications in a good way for projects uh, that we partnered with, like the Battle Bunnies. How can small business owners embrace the concept of introducing animation? Most people, they come to me and they just want animation and they don't know what they want. And they don't know what they think it should cost. One thing is, uh, is trying to keep your business simple, right? So I would never tell anybody, go out there and start an animation company because <laughs> it's too freaking complicated. And the stuff to make it simplified by like putting a process in to do explainer videos is stuff that just doesn't interest me right nobody knows much about animation the good news is there's a lot of cool tools and stuff that that you can create some really cool graphics these days but it all comes down to why like why would you want to obviously there are businesses now that use animation or motion graphics or some level what animation is great for is kind of educating right so mm -hmm. educating tough concepts whether it's finance or rules or you know helping people understand i hate the word explainer video it's like that's what it what it is but it just reminds me of like the meet tom tom is really sad and like that, <laughs> that type of stuff right but you can also do stuff that makes you stand out and makes people remember you right so you could mm -hmm. create ip and that's where i've been on like my soapbox and that's what got me into nfts was continuing to follow uh vayner chuck because i think he's a brilliant business strategist and seeing what he was doing and when he got into nfts i didn't understand it it took me a year of just trying to really wrap my head around it to figure out where this is, could be applicable to an animation company or anybody and because that's we were trying to develop ip and that makes total sense so if you had a character if you made a simple character an aurora consulting mascot that whether oh, i don't know which, you know yeah. so that essentially is your character that you're creating that ip for and then you don't need to go hire some retired football player to kind of pitch your stuff or anything if because that might not be in your budget but you can kind of control the IP of the mascot you're creating and then stacking that on to the ability of really developing that character in other ways beyond just a consulting thing. Mm. Um, there is IP in anything that you create. And a lot of people think like IP is what Star Wars, but the reality is IP is the intellectual property that you created and there's multiple use cases for it. So IP could be an animation in a movie, but it could be merch. It could be a concept. It could be an idea. So our unfantasy sports is a concept that's IP that somebody could come and take uh, and offer us to license it, buy it, something along those lines, right? But that's that's one way I would start to at least explore that. But most people, it doesn't make sense for, I'm saying most, but it makes sense for a lot of people at the same time that are looking to stand out, explain a difficult concept like Newton's second law of motion or whatever the hell it is, or entertain. And I think that's some of the, the content that we're putting out there with the unfantasy stuff too. Look, the Geico gecko is IP. Like you can't just take that gecko and use it and stuff unless you're doing parody content with it which which we have but you could that, that's ip and everybody recognizes that guy code gecko and if you know that's if, right if warner brothers wants to put that in a movie to tell a joke they got to pay that for that unless they're completely being parody since you talked about nfts can we talk about how web3 is helping your business how did the web3 click for you to be a part of the unfan and everything else I'm a very slow learner, so it took me a year of really looking into it to try to understand stuff and just kind of paying attention. The first part that clicked for me was seeing um, a project called Stoner Cats, which is Mia Kunis and Ashton Kutcher. And it, that's the first time it made sense for me. It's like you buy this NFT of these Stoner Cats, and when you have that NFT, you go on their website and you connect your wallet, and you that's the only way you can watch the animation of it. 
and they mm. use that to fund their animation. And they use that to kind of take out the Hollywood, the middleman, right? Which I've worked with voice actresses and actors that they'll go voice over on a big animation. And they know it's like a year at least before that sees the light of day. Because there's just so many steps and red tape that these things that Hollywood's used to long production times and budgets. And I've always been the opposite of that, creating short form content and showing that you could do a concert in five days without having to sit down and do it like the traditional way. That's what it made sense for me because they were using this as a somewhat of a Kickstarter. They were also using it as somewhat of a community building and people were using this as their profile pictures and it's free marketing along the way. So, and those are not new concepts. And I don't think any of the stuff that I can think of offhand is new. They're all concepts that have been prepackaged or use different terminology, but it's the same stuff. And that's when you started to see like you could stack different things. You look at my kids love Pokemon and I wasn't big into the collectible world and not big into Pokemon until they came around and they collect these cards and they'll say, oh my God, I pulled a hollow rare. And it, that is a, a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. And mm. we've experienced it even with baseball cards. You don't know which card you're going to get. You open that pack people are really able to start stacking things on top of things. And that's what really got me excited about it. But to your point, you don't need, it doesn't need to be web three. It doesn't need to be on chain. And when you say on chain for those yeah. who may be watching that are still kind of acclimating to all this language. Yeah. So blockchain as right. far as right. right. Yeah, so. It doesn't need to, doesn't need to be an NFT. You could launch an NFT project with using the same things that NFT projects use, like the excitement of wondering what you're going to get the excitement of, oh, I get this gift card that allows me to jump into this, right? Those are the same things that we're using. It's access. So people say access, util utility, right. Starbucks cards have cute little sayings on them. And literally there are people that collect the art of Starbucks gift cards. But oh. really is what someone's giving them is they're giving them their money to get the card, the physical card mm -hmm. to buy the coffee. That's their utility. It, there's a lot of different use cases. Let me try to not go off on a tangent, just focus in specifically on the unfantasy sports concept because totally right. We could have done that back in the day. This We could have done this the same way. What's cool about this and it could only be done, I think, through NFTs is because NFT concept and seeing the other people's use cases of it and what they were able to do by stacking on all of these different multi-level successful industries and feelings, it allowed me to think of ways like this is how we could do that because we wanted to Mike and I talked about doing an unfantasy sports league seven years ago, mm -hmm. and we didn't wrap our head around how to do it. And the NFT technology allowed us to say, hey, yo, we could do it this way. But if you see in our project, what we did is we stopped listening to all the people that think you have to do it a certain way. We met people where they were comfortable with, or at least tried to, right? So there are people that buy it as an NFT and they use their Ethereum MetaMask wallet and they purchase it that way. But there are people that have no interest and they can just go on the site, traditional web two, and buy the NFT that way. And that's still their digital collectible that it goes into our system that we say, hey, this person owns this one. They can play that card. That's very right. web two, but it has the web three component too. And, and for those that want to partake in that world, we have that option as well. But you meet people where they're comfortable with instead of trying to force new things down their throat. And I think a lot of projects make that mistake. And I think a lot of people feel that they've had uh, things forced to them that they are not ready for. I think it's partially why some of the NFT stuff has a, has a bad name. It was smart that you did incorporate where they can buy it with a credit card versus cryptocurrency. At the end of the day, they still have access because you know that word has come up. They have access to participate participate, they wouldn't have been able to do that if you made it all web three. 100%. I don't think you need to do be all one, in one way or the other. I think you have your web three people that just say, hey, you got to be decentralized completely and you can't have a platform. Don't wear deodorant either. And you have those people. <laughs> and then you have people that are like, I'm not touching this stuff. It scares the hell out of me. There's cool things that you can take, like anything, like marketing. What you do is you look at a lot of things. You're looking at what other people are doing. You see what you like and you ask yourself, does that fit into what I'm doing? And sometimes you see stuff that you hate and you're like, I would never do that, which is just as good. But you kind of take things and make it your own. There's nothing new in this world whatsoever, including NFTs. Hopefully people can understand you, you don't need to jump in and do all NFTs. There's You could take the take some of the, the benefits that they offer and implement that now on a, on a business per case basis. When email came around, how many emails have we gotten from the, you know, Nigerian prince who needs to be, you know, released from jail? So send ransom or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I had a neighbor, she's elderly and she started using PayPal. 
And she called me up in a panic and she said, I got an email from PayPal that my account has to be updated or whatever. I go, mm -hmm. hold the phone. I said, go to PayPal first. Do not click on anything. It's always been like that and always will be like that. Um, but I think where it's become the quote unquote wild, wild west is because there's a lot of money in it and there's a lot of frenzy and there's a lot of people take, when, when that happens, there's a lot of people that are taking advantage of other people and that's what sucks. And so one of the things that when we did start the unfantasy thing, um, because I do believe that I'm, I'm super excited about talking about web three and nfts and because most people don't know what the heck that is and they i think it when they do understand it it could really open up some really cool opportunities for people but i think it's been good to have them kind of onboarded in a good, clean, fun, safe way where, um, you know, they're not jumping in off the deep end and they can, if they're ready for it, they can jump in and buy through MetaMask. But if they're not, they can buy through PayPal. And when they are ready for it, we can help educate them. And this is how you do it. Make sure you don't, you know, answer the Web3 version of the Nigerian prints, connecting your wallets on some random sites, because I think that's what this stuff is. And the technology is not going away, right? right. So maybe they won't call it NFTs and anymore. But I think the reality is digital identities and being able to connect your wallet to a website to get access to something is a password. But I think these things replace passwords. I think having a digital proof of record that you went to Harvard or wherever, and it's not just this diploma that's on my wall over there, not Harvard, uh, but uh, it's a piece of paper that could be forged, uh, having a digital version of that when you're in an interview and being able to show that, right? So I think those are the things that is going, and it may not be all NFT profile pictures, but it, it is part that. You bring up a really good point. And this banner, I put up one of the reasons why Trevor has been the biggest skeptic, because you were kind of going in the direction and talking about the things that people worry about the most. And one of the reasons why Trevor has been the biggest skeptic. Yesterday, I went and had to get my, my emissions test. They sent a postcard. And I was like, Trevor, where's the postcard? <laughs> You know, because the postcard had some vital information for me to streamline this process. And I love how you're saying you're bringing up the points of just the digital identity and things being on the blockchain. It's not far off. People are afraid of jumping in now. But the reality is, is that same thing had already happened. Like history has repeated itself. So when I was a kid, you would go and you had like a passport savings book. Right. And if you would go mm -hmm. put in five bucks, they would stamp and say, hey, you got five bucks. And that was your proof. That was your ledger that you had that. Now, the bank had their own ledger, which is cool. But that's what you would match it up and say, hey, you messed it up. But nobody does that anymore. Right now, everything is digital. Right. So mm -hmm. everything is moving digital. You can pay, you know, your Apple Pay. You can pay your groceries. I don't even bring my wallet anywhere anymore. You don't, right. you don't need to. So that's the technology when people are saying Web3. That's part of it because it's a multitude of things. But that's already happening. And it doesn't make sense to just wait. I mean, the community banks out there that didn't think that those things were going to happen you know a lot of them probably shut down probably also because of the savings and loan crisis too but that's the thing and that's why i don't think anybody should do this because i don't know anybody's personal situations but i think um it is worth as any business owner at least understanding the concept and being like trevor being super sarcastic uh, sarcastic yeah he's sarcastic, too, <laughs> he is sarcastic. But being super, skeptical. super skeptical along the way i think that's the case right so it's not going anywhere and i'm excited about it because i do feel that it is early and uh we are at the forefront of something. But I think what I get most excited about is telling people that it's nothing to fear because it's we've already done this before and the same stuff that we're talking about is just terminology that you're already familiar with. One time, it's funny, I had got a book. I don't even know how I got it, but it is by P.T. Barnum, the mm -hmm. Barnum and Bailey, the circus, right? The book was written mm -hmm. in 1800. You read that thing, apart from like, you know, miladies or whatever, it's the same self-help book that you could pick off a shelf in Barnes and Noble now. It's the same concepts that people are in your face about eating right or like do this with your money. It's the same thing. The reality is, is that this is not new because history is repeating itself through these different technologies and humans are the same. So we're kind of acting in the same way that we have just like you hear stories of grandmas put money under the mattress because they were afraid of the bank, which is the same thing. And unfortunately, that stuff does happen. But as the technology matures, it'll be we won't call it NFT. So one thing that got me and I've had a really good advantage of having kids in this age group because it's put me in a spot to watch content that I would not watch normally. It's put me in a spot to see what they're doing and they are way bigger than in our generations. They're already understanding these things. And mm. last Christmas, my boy was uh, eight at the time 
they didn't ask for Amazon gift cards. They asked for Robux gift cards, which is the currency that you get with Roblox playing the game. So, so you, again, so what they're doing is they are exchanging dollars for a gift card that they then put in there that becomes Robux. So they've already has in their head, like digital currency trading is not foreign to them, where it's us, That's it's right. super scary, but they, they get it. And what's cool, I wish I had it in front of me, but when I got the gift card, they obviously know what to do and who they're marketing to, but it says $50 equals X amount of Robux, whatever that conversion currency is, which is no different from Bitcoin or ETH to dollars now. Mm-hmm. But then it said, comes with a free virtual item and they loved it. They talk about their skins that they get to wear and the shoes. My kids are big Celtics fans, so they get to buy with their Robux Celtics jerseys to wear oh, with their digital wow. identities and they're conversing in servers that was like to to us sounds like to me anyway it sounds like super technology but they get it the gift card said comes with a free virtual item explore millions of worlds so when we're talking about VR and that's crazy and nobody would ever do that stuff these kids are already doing it mm-hmm. and they already get it so they're they're trading digital currencies they're in virtual metaverses and they understand the importance to them of a virtual item, which by the way, is a NFT in some yeah. ways, right? So yeah. my kid, the second thing they asked for recently were these glasses and they're super goofy, but they're like these ski glasses that were popular in the eighties that are coming back around, but they're just, there's no, there's just one visor thing that goes around. It looks like Robocop, but mm-hmm. the glasses that they got were stuff that they bought digitally. And then they were like, I want that one. So it's like the worlds are already connecting. The kids Um, already understand this stuff. So they will build this stuff up in a different way. And this is not something that's going to go away. And I think it's it's smart of the ones that understand it and can use it applicably because you'll be so early. And the trend line is saying Web3 is, is here to stay. And it's more than just one thing like NFTs. It's no different from when the internet was first introduced as a means for accessing information. I come from where you had to buy the encyclopedia, book by book, That's letter, my, yep, letter yep. by letter, by alphabet, you know? Yep. And uh, and then the book, what happens when something new pops up that they got to do a whole new book, you know? Right. It's just technology, but everyone's just thinking of cryptocurrency and everybody's also thinking of getting scammed. That always happens everywhere. And the threat is real. So definitely don't want to sugarcoat Minimize that stuff. Minimize it's, right. That's why it's cool. That's to kind of help people get on board from, from there. But I, like I said, I am a slow learner and I think the terminologies to get around it were hard. And I just always like to dummy it down. That's how I got it. So but your example of the encyclopedia is great because if you think about it, one, I have a book, an encyclopedia that was my great, great grandmother used in her fourth grade class, which is super cool. But it has oh. th- like, first off, there's things that are wrong in there, like you said, and there's some things in there that you would never put in a kid's book or encyclopedia book. If you think about people try to explain web three to me, it was always confusing. And it's like, read only, right? And it's like, what are you talking? I, I don't get that stuff. I, I understand it now, but it, that's not the way I was going to comprehend it. But if you think about before the web, there's two things here, right? Before the web, if you wanted to send a message to somebody, you would do it the postal service, right? Then web came and you would use email. And then web two came and that was like interactive messaging, right? Mm-hmm. And your encyclopedia is a perfect example because there used to be encyclopedia salesmen that would knock right. on your doors. So you bought them, they would be on like the uh, some sort of like table in the grocery store when you'd walk in and they'd try to like, I can only afford A through D. You know, that's, that stinks. They never learned about Neptune or, or Pluto. Thankfully, they didn't learn about Pluto because that's wrong. There's not a planet anymore if we got that encyclopedia. <laughs> But, but that was their job. And um, the, then I remember vividly when I was a kid and I was watching the Radio Shack and seeing Encyclopedia Britannica playing on the computer screen. It was like uh, cheetahs and gorillas. And that was the new version. That was like when the web came out. And that was the new version of these encyclopedias was these CD-ROMs. And then Web 2, mm-hmm. when people say like, that's read and write. That doesn't make sense to me, but the reality is Web2, take that same encyclopedia, it became Wikipedia. You could read it, but then you could also contribute to it. That's the writing part of it, right? So Web2 is the social media where people are contributing to the conversation and the content. And then Web3, I have the VR goggle. Mike and I play golf every morning on it, but I went inside of a painting that is a famous painting and I went into it and you walk around in it. And so I'm experiencing that in a Web3 three way, which is super cool. 
um, as one way for Web3. So it's, it's evolved and all of these technologies are evolving. It's going to continue to evolve. It's so funny that you say that because Trevor and I, when we were in Manhattan, we went to the Van Gogh exhibit. Talk about being immersed into a painting and the fact that you were doing that with your VR goggles and in the metaverse and you didn't have to physically go to Manhattan and deal with the traffic. That's part of the reason why with this channel, while it could be a little discouraging for people. I absolutely was not going to shy away from introducing that Web3 is just merely a technology and tools for a small business to amplify their message, to bring to life all of the storytelling and all of the branding and all the creative content that you've been specializing in, whether it's through the book that you were represented in with Mark Schaefer or the animation with the Emmy, you know. With the screw loose Emmy. Oh, the screw loose. <laughs> I would never change that ever. That is so cool. So I think my last question is what's one of the things that you were not prepared for in starting to be an entrepreneur? We talked about a lot of challenges that it, when it's, when you're running a business, but is there anything that stands out in your mind that surprises you the most that is like, Oh man, I, I better deal with that or I better get used to that. Whether you label it as entrepreneur or whatnot, I think ones that thrive or or run to that career are people that like solving problems and understand that there's going to be problems and solutions around every bend and there's going to be ups and downs, but you're kind of just enjoying the journey. So there's a million things I wasn't prepared for, but that's the whole point. And uh, the digital collectible Web3 space, we weren't prepared for anything because we didn't know anything and we've made mistakes and we'll continue to make mistakes, but it's just understanding that the lows don't get too low, the highs don't get too high and everything in between just keep moving forward forward. Uh, one of my favorite Disney animations of all time is um, the Robins meet the Robinsons. Big part of it is they took a Walt Disney quote and the whole theme of it is just keep moving forward. Right. And that's the whole goal. And and that's kind of what I've tried to do is when you, you look back, you realize how much you've accomplished. And I was, I was very good at it before COVID about taking notes in a journal of business of just even what I did that day for that stuff, because not to do dear diary stuff, but to look back even three months sometimes and you're like, oh shit, you remember where you are right now. We're having this conversation and you forget sometimes to step back that you, you won an Emmy award and your team pulled these things off in 30 days and at concert in five days. And you got to stop and take a breath sometimes and see those things. So I don't know if that answers your question at all. It, you answered it perfectly because it's human behavior. If you're always afraid, you're never going to try anything. So mm -hmm. you have to just try it and then know you're going to trip along the way, but it's the getting up part that makes all the difference. Yep. There's a really good animation that we produced with Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx, um, that talks about that. And I think it's super important, but you hear all these stories of people that didn't know what the hell they were doing. Uh, they just started it. And I think it's very common when you read these autobiographies of business people, none of us know what they're doing. And I think some people put a good face on and can speak really eloquently or write a good book or say things so confidently that you think they have it figured out. But the reality is nobody does. And I think just starting it and understanding that you're going to make mistakes and going to continue to do it, that's that's freeing. And I think the, I think also the people that I've seen that have um, done really great at networking and meeting people is the ones that aren't, aren't afraid to just start the conversation. They're not afraid to be stupid. And I mm -hmm. think that's what Sarah Blakely is talking about is just don't be afraid to be stupid and uh, or appear that, like ask the dumb question because th there's been a lot of missed opportunity for How people that, that don't ask the question that they think is stupid. Big part of the issues is for me and other people I've seen is we try to mask our expertise, right? We say we, we want people to look at us a certain way. And uh, if we don't, they, we think that's a failure. But in reality, that's, that's not the case. And I think that slows a lot of people down. For sure. Yeah, really enjoyed hearing about all your endeavors and your Emmys. There's another one coming, I'm sure. I did use Emmys plural. I'm manifesting for you because you're doing the hard work and making shit fun, right? Yeah, one of our old um, slogans, I guess, was Facebook had this thing called move fast and break things, was move fast and create things. But that's kind of what we, we were doing. But yeah, we want to make shit fun. If it's not fun, what the hell are you doing it for? Well, how can people find you? Where are you to be found? Um, LinkedIn, I guess you threw that that up there. There we go. But you also have um, the Food Fight Studios. Food Fight Studios is our is the name of our animation company. Unfan.xyz is the stuff that we're getting our hands dirty and playing around in, in Web3. The BattleBunnies.io is that our, our project that we're implementing the things that, that we are testing out and learning as we go. But the best way specifically would, would be LinkedIn on that stuff. 
simple sense for small business. Thank you, John Briggs, aka JL, aka Unfan, oh, aka, AKA Paul Bruce Logan. <laughs> So, John, thanks so much for joining us, and I'm excited to see all the things, and I definitely will see you in Telegram at the Unfan. Thank you so much.